uh, it's a privilege to uh, make some presentation here on something which is, in a way, out of the ordinary. What do I mean? That's because on July 4th, 2012, oh, that was such a big news, right? The standard model is finally confirmed. We have found the Higgs. At first, they say Higgs-like particle, but now everybody agrees. We have found the Higgs. And when I heard that news, I actually was one of those, uh, let's say, blessed people from America. I was not in America, I was here. So 9 a.m. press conference is 3 p.m. here. That's okay. And I was, uh, you know, with the, the uh, web conference, and man, it was really good to see this excitement. It was truly very exciting. And the question that came to my mind was, you have found a bump. And now, as a uh, good physicist, in the old days, when you see a resonance, is it your immediate conclusion that it is just one single thing that is there? Or do you now say, well, perhaps there are some structures in there, right? I mean, as a good experimental physicist, as a good physicist with no prejudice, you would then ask that question. But of course, because it is the standard model, the standard theory that required only one Higgs, man, you see one bump, you say, that's it. But for me, I was just wondering, could it be? So you know what, I was, first I was waiting for, oh, that there would be a better statistics, or oh, that they would see maybe two bumps. That would be more exciting than one bump, right? Wouldn't that be? I mean, everybody says, I would like to see that maybe it is not quite exactly the standard model. Maybe there's some difference. Well, it didn't. It was sort of stayed always as one. And then I began to sort of wonder, and now I would just want to take you through this. Uh, well, how do I do this? Can somebody teach me? I think if you, if you use this one, we'll go from oh, okay, to the okay. one to the right where you can't see it. Right, right, right. right. Or okay, you can no. use, you yeah. use that too. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, maybe I will say something about this because uh, <clears throat> we have all been celebrating Yang Mills. Does anybody ask, who is Mills? Does anybody care who is Mills? Well, I sort of am one who wants to sort of give credit where it is due. Of course, Professor Yang, nobody doubts that he is. And indeed, it should be Yang Mills and not Mills Yang. But who is Mills? Well, he's just simply a very modest guy who says, for him, it's such a blessing to be an index to a field. Yang Mills. And he never sort of say, oh, you know, I, I did this, I contributed, oh, the commutator. And that it was really by discussion that I said, well, how about doing the commutator? And then everything worked out very well. He did not come, you know, sort of insist on that. And I just wanted to say that it was really this uh, blessing that he spent summer at Brookhaven. And during that time, there was a sharing of the office, and collaboration is one where you happen to share an office, and someone has already had that seed in him for the last three, four years, even as a graduate student in Chicago. Well, finally, in discussing, something happened and clicked, and there you have this Yang Mills field. So I just wanted to, since I'm from the East, New York, I just wanted to remind everybody what and where Brookhaven is. right? And this is, of course, we already know. And now, the thing that has become the standard of all theory is this thing called the standard model, which requires you to build not just the Yang-Mills field, of course, you need that as the fundamental ingredient, but you need to dress it with many, many things. And here I will uh, uh, mention a proverb which some people may or may not like to hear. By wisdom, it's a house built. And through understanding, it is established. By wisdom, is a house built. 
Oh, you know, you need something like a gauge principle in order to be the fundamental foundation of this standard model. But you really need a lot of understanding. As somebody says, you have a house with no plumbing, or it can be the most beautiful house, but nobody can live in it. Well, there are some plumbing issues, right? As we all know, the people who work with standard model, it took, what was it now, uh, like uh, 17 years, 20 years, before it really got fully established. And the plumbing involves some names too. Oh well, okay, we can go through here, it doesn't matter. The plumbing involves this Yukawa coupling. Now all the people who work in the standard model, they have come to accept it. What do they accept? This, uh, oh, how do you use the pointer? Oh, ah, this uh, Yukawa, Yukawa matrix is a complex matrix. And as everybody knows, it has so many parameters. And uh, the uh, Feynman has reported to have said, oh, it cannot be right. For a long while, he just says, it's so ugly. You need a long sheet of paper to write down the whole full Lagrangian when you spell it all out. It cannot be right. But we have come to accept it. Why? Because experiment seems to verify it. This uh, machinery for uh, calculation of standard model, now it is up to next to next to next leading order. Is that right? N, 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 L, O. Are there experts here? Is it N, 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 L, O? Something. Right. I mean, so it, it's really impressive. It's something where you say it may be the most ugly from a personal point of view, most ugly kind of a plumbing system, but man, it works. But it is still, to me, a question. Could it be that there is some way to fix the plumbing and still maintain the standard model, the successes of the standard model? Well, uh, we can go through here because that's not the issue here. So, my question is, could it be a single Higgs or could there be several, many Higgs? What if the Higgs has many brothers? All right, that's, if it is just a sem empty speculation, well, we can just simply go home. It's just empty speculation. But can there be a basis in which you ask that question? Well, oh, well, yes, I want to give a name Nambu Goldstone Bosons, because without Nambu, without Goldstone, the plumbing would not be complete, right? You need to be able to flush it. So now, what I wanted to do then is to say, hey, what if, fellows, we consider moving the complexity of this Yukawa matrix, right? Move it to this Higgs field. Let this Higgs field now carry family tree. Now, until I came to this conference, I had not known of this uh, FSM, Fremont, uh, what? Yes, Frame Standard Model. I wish I had known that, and I would then have given you proper credit, because in some sense, that's what you're doing, but not in the language I'm using, because what I'm saying here is, oops, We transfer the whole complexity of this Yukawa coupling matrix to this family tree. And now if you do it that way, oh, if you do it where, that way, you still have this issue of this uh, set of uh, you know, Yukawa matrix for the up quark and a set of uh, Yukawa matrix for the down quark. And if in the standard model, you have only a single, you know, Higgs. You just have two sets of Yukawa matrices. But now if you shift it, you now have to shift it with, uh, it's better to shift it to two family trees. All right? Now if you do it that way, I will go in further and I say, what if instead of a uh, Yukawa coupling constant for the upper family, and Yukawa coupling constant for the down family, what if you just make it symmetric and equal? 
if you are going to explore in this direction, or let's just make it equal. So I will introduce this thing called R symmetry, so that indeed they are equal. And to do that, you have to do some, uh, you know, uh, introduce an R symmetry operation. And if you do that, you need to extend SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 and introduce an extra U1 for the right-handed guy, which is going to be heavy anyway. So I am sort of embedding it in SU2L cross SU2R cross U1 cross SU3. So if you do that, and I just wanted to convince some of the experts that indeed I have been careful, all right? I have been careful to do all of this, and I will now come to the issue of what's the Higgs potential? Because with everything, if you now want to do, uh, uh, to be responsible physicist, you've got to now say, hey, the plumbing system, there is only a standard plumbing system. Whenever you flush, the whole thing now goes, right? So you have to be sure that you have the Nambu Goldstone bosons, the correct number of them. Because if you flush, boops, you find that uh, you don't have enough uh, Nambu Goldstone bosons, you shouldn't even be standing here. And for a while, uh, it took a little bit of uh, practice to be sure that when you flush it, it is the right flushing. So if you now write down a, uh, the general Higgs potential consistent with that R symmetry, you would then have something like this. And if you now want to break it, or you will now say that it would be with respect to some vacuum, which you now say, I really don't know. Uh, but I was so impressed by uh, uh, Professor Chan, Hong Mo Chan, where they were able to do it in terms of uh, this uh, FSM, where they are able to do it in terms of the geometry of this sphere. I, I, I need to learn. Uh, one of my own uh, determination is, after hearing the talk, that I need to study their paper and learn more about what they do. But in any case, if you now write down this Higgs potential, you check that the number of Goldstone bosons is the correct number. Well, I have, I, I can assure you, I did spend a lot of time doing this, and it is. Uh, and now, when you do it, you find the Goldstone bosons, the ones that are the normal kind, associated with and the gauge bosons acquire mass. And then there's the Weinberg-Georgi decoupling theorem, which says that the heavy guys will decouple in just the right way. And they require masses. And now, I want to focus on the J equal to 3 family, because that is the most uh, uh, leading family because of this hierarchy that says that the top quark mass is so much heavier than the other generations. So if you now focus on the J equal to 3, you now can write down what are the masses, right? And when I was first doing it, I did not go the full route where I say, what if? And the reason why I want to now do this, what if, is if there is some structure, it would not be that nice if you have something here, and something here, and something here, how great and wonderful it would be if they were all degenerate at the same mass. If they were all degenerate at the same mass, oh man, the quantum mechanics of this is so much richer. And so I said, hey, what if? What if you now say you make all of them degenerate? All the brothers and sisters, you have the same mass at least at tree level. Because with all of these, you may start out with the same mass, but after a while, because of renormalization, because of uh, all the other high order effects, N, 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 L, O, and so on, or they will now acquire slightly different masses. But that's OK. The theory itself, if you start with everybody being degenerate, you could at least see what are the possible consequences. Well, one of the interesting consequences is that if you now take these, 
in the and you take the leading j equal to three, the, the top family, then all of these have the same mass. There will be two scalar fields, and this one is the exact analog of the standard model Higgs. This HA is the exact standard model Higgs. HB is the orthogonal combination, because you know we all know in uh, perturbation theory, in quantum mechanics, that if you have a degenerate system, you can have orthogonal states, one state, which we identify with the usual Higgs, and then the other state must be the orthogonal one. And I don't know how to invent the right notation, so I'll just call it H A H B. All right? So these are the standard Higgs. This is the orthogonal Higgs. Then there is the imaginary part, but the imaginary part of the standard Higgs is a Goldstone boson, so that's absorbed. But the imaginary part of this orthogonal one is a pseudo-scalar field. All right? So therefore, you will now say that if you have seen the Higgs, and if indeed it is part of a family, that that bump that you see is the two scalar H and H prime, let's say, or H A and H B, and then the pseudo scalar Z, I call it Z B. All right. So if that is the case, I'm just. Uh, all right, for, for leptons, but since I'm not an expert with leptogenesis, let's go on. Let's only focus on. I'm just of uh, phenomenological implications. Uh, there is now a, the difference between the uh, HA and HB is they have a certain preference that are orthogonal. This HA likes to couple to top quark. HB instead likes to tuple, uh, couple to the B quark, and they are orthogonal. And so HA, the uh, for example the 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 width would be smaller than HB, because HB likes to couple to the bottom quark. And this now, uh, has implications. In all of the gluon fusion, in all of the LHC production processes, most of the time, what you see are HA, because it's W, the gauge bosons, they only know about the HA. HB is orthogonal to it, and when you do the, the gauge fixing terms and so on, it, it is only HA, believe me. So likewise, you have the vector boson fusion, it's only HA. But gluon fusion, oh, now there is where the richness of this quantum mechanics can come through. Why? Because you say, hey, the stop clock loop, it can produce not just the normal standard model Higgs, but it can also produce the orthogonal state, HB, and the pseudo-scalar, ZB. All right? Now, if you can now produce these, and likewise with the associative production, the nature of the coupling of uh, HA is, it likes to couple, oh, and my notation is, this is related to the top quark mass, this is related to the bottom quark mass, and V is much larger than V hat. So HA likes to couple to top, the HB likes to, likes to couple to the bottom, all right? And there is this orthogonal V plus V hat and V hat minus V. I, I want to point this out because that's quantum mechanics, that's undergraduate quantum mechanics. And now if I now go and look at a uh, production process like uh, gluon fusion producing a BB bar. I choose BB bar because I am more familiar with it, right? And now if you look at the, uh, the quantum mechanics of it, you can produce HA and you can produce HB. They can interfere. It depends on the nature of your coupling. They can interfere. If you have only one single Higgs, there's never interference 
you produce it and you decay, and so you can just say the cross-section is production probability, decay, and then that's it. But if you now allow for the possibility of indeed having a family, oh man, when you have a family, you can have constructive interference, you can have destructive interference, and you can have quarrels between your family members. And in this case, on resonance, HA, HB, they cancel against each other. Uh, no, no, sorry. Uh, on, on resonance, their, uh, their numerator, they, they, they look like they cancel, but the width of A and B being different, because HA likes to decay to top quark, but it can't because it doesn't have enough energy, so its width is smaller, but HB, it likes to decay into bottom. So man, its decay width is much bigger, and therefore, in here, even though the numerator would have cancelled against, against each other if the width were the same, but because this width is so much smaller than this width, the bump is basically the big brother. The standard Higgs, oh, that is your big. Because the other guy, oh, his width is so much bigger, it's like uh, you can hardly see the signal. All right? So it is no surprise. At the LHC, you can do better and better precision, you will just still see this big bump from this HA. But now, meanwhile, there is also on resonance the pseudoscalar. The pseudoscalar, it can also be produced and decay. And this width is also relatively large because it's part of the B branch, right? And it likes to couple to the bottom quark. So this width is also big, and therefore it is also hiding underneath. Therefore, on resonance, the interference between the two brothers, A and B, they basically is there, but because A has a shorter, smaller uh, decay width, it dominates, so you will be seeing all of HA. Off resonance, let us now go off resonance. If you now go off resonance, if you go off resonance, yes, I know, <laughs> I will go off resonance soon, so. <laughs> if you go off resonance, S is bigger than, let's say, all of these widths, and therefore, it is now the interference between the nature of the coupling that matters, and what you'll find is that, oh, A and B, they cancel each other, off resonance. But how about the pseudoscalar? A pseudoscalar, guys, it will still be there. There's nothing to interfere with. And so off resonance, you will see some uh, signal of Higgs. So now what does that mean? That means that on resonance, oh, you have measured. Because at first, when uh, the uh, Higgs was discovered, there was a question, is it a scalar or is it pseudoscalar? And man, they did do, and the, uh, they did measure, and they found that it was scalar. So on resonance, it is indeed a scalar. But now what this says is, haha, you go off resonance, you think it is still scalar. Because if you have only one Higgs, off resonance, it will still be scalar. But now this says, ooh, wait a minute. As a good experimentalist, you should actually check off resonance, is it still scalar or pseudoscalar? And what this says is that, man, when you're off resonance, it is pseudoscalar. And now, one other fact, and this is all at the leading order, you can also check that the production of this of a pseudoscalar for large S approaches like what a standard model single scalar would have given. In other words, it's not that the pseudoscalar cross-section off resonance, oh, it's totally off. No, it mimics what your standard model Higgs cross-section would be off resonance. So there shows, or there comes the interesting possibility that indeed your true uh, picture of what you have discovered in your uh, you know, LHC can have more riches than you even, even imagine if only you allow the Higgs to be part of a family. And uh, 
my friend is now saying I should go off resonance, and so I shall, and I thank you. Spoken like someone who has been a chair of this team yesterday. <laughs> Wants to keep on time. So we have a question. Well, in terms of the on and off resonance, I mean, experimentally, that's difficult to do. Would, but I they mean, actually have tried to look at it off resonance. So and you, it's, you mean off resonance meaning far, far away? Right? Well, I don't know. Is it like a, this one is uh, at uh, 125, right? Yeah. I think they did it for 300, 400, 500. And indeed, it agrees with what the standard model tells you it should be, how much off resonance. What I'm just saying is that that does not prove. Because if you indeed you have this conspiracy in your family, man, you better go check off resonance whether it is still scalar or pseudoscalar. Uh, and that's all. I'm, I'm not saying that, oh, this must be right, because it's not up to me or you or any one of us to say it must be right. But the question is, as an experimentalist, as an you know, inquiring scientist, what you have to ask is, could it be? And indeed, until you have answered the question, you cannot say, Oh, everything is uh, the way it should be. Yes, yeah, sorry, he's the chair. Yeah, I know. Lepton is the part when I'm not that, as confident as... Uh, I, I, I need to do a lot more work. Here is just but like a brief reminder to all. But I need a lot more people who have interest in this to say, Oh, I must now check the lepton sector. I must check this, I must check that. 